Welcome to Old Treasures Made New, your devotional podcast on the go or at home where we read the scriptures and reflect on them with those from the past. Today we're reading Mark 9, verses 1 to 13, and then through J.C. Rao's expository thoughts on Mark. Please take a moment to pause and to ask the Holy Spirit to bring understanding and to apply what we hear. Mark, chapter 9, verses 1 to 13. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, Why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how is it written of the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come. And they did to him whatever they pleased, as it was written of him. And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them, and the scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. This is the word of the Lord. The connection of this passage with the end of the last chapter ought never to be overlooked. Our Lord had been speaking of his own coming death and passion, of the necessity of self-denial, if men would be his disciples, of the need of losing their lives, if we would have them saved. But in the same breath, he goes on to speak of his future kingdom and glory. He takes off the edge of his hard sayings by promising a sight of that glory to some of those who heard him. In the history of the transfiguration, which is here recorded, we see that promise fulfilled. The first thing which demands our notice in these verses is the marvelous vision they contain of the glory which Christ and his people shall have at his second coming. There can be no doubt that this was one of the principal purposes of the transfiguration. It was meant to teach the disciples that though their Lord was lowly and poor in appearance now, he would one day appear in such royal majesty as became the Son of God. It was meant to teach those who who when their master came the second time, his saints, like Moses and Elijah, would appear with him. It was meant to remind them that though reviled and persecuted now, because they belonged to Christ, they would one day be clothed with honor and be partakers of their master's glory. We have reason to thank God for this vision. We are often tempted to give up on Christ's service because of the cross and affliction which it entails. We see few with us and many against us. We find our names cast out as evil and all manner of evil said of us because we believe and love the gospel. Year after year, we see our companions in Christ's service removed by death, and we feel as if we knew little about them except that they had gone to an unknown world and that we are left alone. All these things are trying to flesh and blood. No wonder that the faith of believers sometimes languishes and their eyes fail while they look for their hope. Let us see in the story of the transfiguration a remedy for such doubting thoughts as these. The vision of the holy mount is a gracious pledge that glorious things are in store for the people of God. Their crucified Savior shall come again in power and great glory. His saints shall all come with him and are in safe keeping until that happy day. We may patiently wait. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Colossians 3, 4. 
The second thing which demands our notice in this passage is the strong expression of the Apostle Peter when he saw his Lord transfigured. Master, he said, it is good for us to be here. No doubt there was much in this saying which cannot be commended. It showed an ignorance of the purpose for which Jesus came into the world, to suffer and die. It showed a forgetfulness of his brethren who were not with him, and of the dark world which so much needed his master's presence. Above all, the proposal which he made at the same time to make three tents for Moses, Elijah, and Christ showed a low view of his master's dignity and implied that he did not know that a greater than Moses and Elijah was there. In all these respects, the apostle's exclamation is not to be praised, but to be blamed. But having said this, let us not fail to remark what joy and happiness this glorious vision conferred on this warm-hearted disciple. Let us see in his fervent cry, It is good to be here. What comfort and consolation the sight of glory can give to a true believer. Let us look forward and try to form some idea of the pleasure which the saints shall experience when they shall at last meet their Lord Jesus in his second coming and meet to part no more. A vision of a few minutes was sufficient to warm and stir Peter's heart. The sight of two saints in glory was so cheering and quickening that he would gladly have enjoyed more of it. What then shall we say when we see our Lord appear at the last day with all his saints? What shall we say when we ourselves are allowed to share in his glory and join the happy company and feel that we shall go out no more from the joy of the Lord? These are questions that no man can answer. The happiness of that great day of gathering together is one that we cannot now conceive. The feelings of which Peter had a little foretaste will then be ours in full experience. We shall all say with one heart and one voice when we see Christ and all his saints, it is good to be here. The last thing which demands our notice in this passage is the distinct testimony which it bears to Christ's office and dignity as the promised Messiah. We see this testimony first in the appearance of Moses and Elijah, the representatives of the law and the prophets. They appear as witnesses that Jesus is he whom they spoke in old times and of whom they wrote that he would come. They disappear after a few minutes and leave Jesus alone as though they would show that they were only witnesses and that our master having come, the servants resigned to him the chief place. We see this testimony secondly in the miraculous voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved son, listen to him. The same voice of God the Father, which was heard at our Lord's baptism, was heard once more at his transfiguration. On both occasions, there was the same solemn declaration, This is my beloved Son. On that last occasion, there was an addition of three most important words, Listen to him. The whole conclusion of the vision was calculated to leave a lasting impression on the minds of the three disciples. It taught them in the most striking manner that their Lord was far above them in the prophets, as the master of a house is above the servants, and that they must in all things believe, follow, obey, trust, and listen to him. Finally, the last words of the voice from heaven are words that should be ever before the minds of all true Christians. They should listen to Christ. He is the great teacher. Those who would be wise must learn from him. He is the light of the world. Those who would not err must follow him. He is the head of the church. Those who would be living members of his mystical body must ever look to him. The grand question that concerns us all is not so much what man says or ministers say, what the church says or what councils say, but what says Christ. Let us hear him. In him let us abide. On him let us lean. To him let us look. He and he only will never fail us, never disappoint us, and never lead us astray. Happy are they who know experimentally the meaning of the text. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. John 10, 27-28 that is the end of Ryle's expository thoughts for these verses. 
Let us carefully consider what we have heard today, and may the Lord be pleased to bring the growth for His glory. In considering what we've just heard, would you prayerfully ask yourself and others the following questions? When tempted or doubting, do we find comfort in the hope that God has promised? Does this future grace give us grace for today? With that in mind, number two, when was the last time we sought to form some idea of the pleasure that will be ours at the second coming of Christ? When we do, do we find joy and strength from the thought of it? And lastly, the Father tells us to listen to His Son. Have these words directed and brought clarity to our daily lives. How helpful this is in a world with so many voices vying for our attention.